I'd like to welcome you to this edition of Living the Little Way. We're going to be talking about the preservation of faith today, how we prepare our young people to hold on to their faith and to grow in their faith when they lead home. Just a few things coming up this week here at St. Therese Parish. Uh, this weekend, we will be celebrating uh, both New Year's, uh, the Feast of Mary, our mother, and also uh, the Feast of the Epiphany. This year, the Feast of Mary, our mother, is not a holy day of obligation, but we will have a vigil mass at 4 p.m. on Friday afternoon, and then a mass at 9 a.m. on Saturday. There'll also be the vigil mass for Sunday, or for the Feast of the Epiphany on Saturday, and then the regular mass schedule on Sunday, uh, 8.30, 10.45, and then 7 p.m. Also a reminder that religious education classes again start not this week, but next week, uh, and so be aware of that. Just a mention about the Synod on Synodality. Uh, we'll be doing some work on uh, some various uh, survey instruments that we are going to be sharing with you to get your opinion about different aspects of church life. Uh, and we'll also be conducting some parish meetings. So please just kind of stay tuned to the various uh, activities that will be associated with this synod. <music> Statistics suggest that nearly 65% of our young people fall away from the faith. Many of them return, but uh, it's a long, hard journey. Uh, so today we're going to be talking to some of our young people about how they preserve their faith when they went away to school. Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you to this edition of Living the Little Way. Today, I'm happy to have with me uh, three of our uh, students from St. Therese Parish, uh, Juliana Peters, who's a junior at O'Gorman High School, Avery Starr, who is a sophomore at SDSU, and Jaden Fetrell, who is a freshman at the University of North Dakota. And we're gathered today to talk about uh, how young people preserve their faith when they leave home. As you know, statistics suggest that nearly 65% of our young people uh, leave the faith once they leave home. Uh, and so these are three examples today of young people who have endured in their faith, kept their faith, uh, and we're gathered today to pick their brains a little bit to find out uh, how they did it. So I welcome all of you today. Juliana, you are the youngest of the ones that are with us this morning, and you've got another year before you graduate and head off to college. Where are you planning on attending? Um, I'm planning on going to uh, UND, so University mm -hmm. of North Dakota, for physical therapy. So you have some time left before you venture out. What do you think are going to be some of the biggest hurdles that you're going to have to overcome? I think finding whether it's a group of friends that you can go to church with or if someone questions why you're like Catholic or something like that, whether they think it's wrong, you just trying to have to keep your faith during those times. So you're talking about the ability to defend your faith. Yeah. Um, and to give a rationale for why you have it. Avery, you have been gone now for nearly a year and a half, um, and you are a communications uh, and journalism major at SDSU. Um, and you're also very active in campus ministry there at the Newman Center. Tell me about how you kept your faith. Um, I think using the resources we have available at SDSU, we have a very nice Newman Center. We have five focused missionaries. So using the priest and the missionaries there as much as possible 
one thing they push with the focus missionaries is the four pillars of discipleship. So using all four of those with the community we have is probably the best way I've seen of keeping the faith. So staying involved in a deliberate Catholic community. Yeah. Jaden, you um, are just starting. Your first semester is now finished up at uh, the University of North Dakota. You told me a story when you came back um, home about how you had to uh, run the mass on Sunday mornings. You had 15 minutes between the time your practice was over and the time the mass started. Tell me a little bit about what motivated you to run all the way across campus and then drive a mile to the church to make it in time for mass. Yeah, well, going up to college, I had set a goal to make sure that I was in mass every Sunday, whether, you know, whether I made it in time, whether I was a little bit late. As long as I had my butt in that pew every Sunday, I knew that I'd be all right. So being that fall camp, our schedule was set on a four days on and then a one day off basis. There were a lot of days where I'd have my full like 14 hour day of, of uh, football on a Sunday. And I wouldn't necessarily be able to have a free day to go to whatever time mass I wanted to. And so I'd get done with practice about 1045 ish. And the only time available that I could make it to um, mass was at 11 o'clock. And so being that I had this in my head and once I get something in my head, I can't really get rid of it. I, as soon as I got done with practice, took off my cleats, you know, ran out to the locker room, got all my stuff ready and headed over to mass and my uh, team issued year. And so I think for me, it was just more about actually being in the place, being where, you know, I know my faith is strong and being in, you know, that holy place to give even, you know, amongst my very hectic day and hour of my time to the Lord. And I know that as long as I can continue to keep doing that, keep being there and being present, I know that my faith will continue to grow because I'm surrounding myself with people who are investing in their faith as well. So I'm going to throw this question out to whoever would like to respond to, to it. What do you think um, causes young people to give up their faith? You know, I, uh, I'm in a Bible study group with, my, uh, with some other athletes at UND through the Newman Center and uh, surprisingly enough there are a lot of guys who go to Bible study on Tuesday nights but can't make it to church on Sunday and so I think one busyness if you will is is something that is a major factor and people straying away from at least one going to church on Sunday and eventually their faith I think you know, pushing it off and making it right in your mind by saying, oh, I have a lot of homework. Oh, I have finals to study for. Oh, I have this going on it, in the coming week. I need to stay home and be prepared. I can always, you know, catch an online version of mass or something and then end up never really doing it. I think that's sort of the road that leads down to just eventually not even thinking about going to mass on Sundays. And I think if we can sort of stop that and realize that an hour of our time is not going to affect the amount of homework that we need to get done or maybe manage our time better, we'll end, we'll end up with a better result versus the one that we have a lot of the time now. So it's really about setting priorities and exactly. then living them. Really, Anna, you're um, still at O'Gorman, and there's been a lot of work going on in the last year or so about uh, trying to make O'Gorman a more deliberately Catholic school. Do you see the fruits of that this year? Yeah, I definitely think like making everyone go to mass every single week. I know that's been a change and some people are like, I don't want to do that. But in reality, I think a lot of people enjoy that time where they can go and like ha celebrate the Eucharist and be with other people that are also surrounding themselves with um, more religious or faith-filled people. And I think that it truthfully brings out more goodness throughout the school because they have that time to sit there and pray and worship the Lord. Avery, I'm gonna direct this question at you because I know um, at least 
when you were a senior in high school, you had some questions about faith um, and that you struggled a little bit with answering that. How did you make it through those times when you were questioning what's all this about? Most of it was just prayer. So just allowing myself silence to like just let like the questions I have and like really wrestle with that instead of just distracting myself with busyness and work. And like it was Pascal who said that like man's biggest problem is that he can't sit with himself for an hour without any noise or something like that. And I think just allowing myself to just be with myself and like be vulnerable enough with the Lord to like bring to him the stuff I was struggling with, I think was really helpful. So you had to go through some painful times. It oh wasn't yeah. Always it was, easy. yeah, definitely not easy. And it's like a process that's still continuing on like, even like these past few weeks, like in prayer, like realizing like the lies that the evil one told me for me to have those struggles and everything that I believed for a long time. Do you think that when you have to struggle, and I'm going to throw this out to any of, of you, do you think when you have to struggle with your faith and then come through the other side that it makes you stronger? I think it does. I mean... Personally, when I experienced, like, troubling times in my faith, I was, like, you, kind of what Avery said, you have to sit there with yourself and your thoughts. And at the end of the day, like, you become a stronger person because you just sat there and, like, were willing to maybe have a conversation with God. And I think it does make you stronger at the end of the day. Jane, you sometimes come from a, a culture in terms of, athletes where sometimes people don't have much faith left anymore. So how do you struggle in that situation where you're saying, wait a minute, faith really is important to me. Uh, and, you know, to maybe even influence them to reconsider their position. You know, it is it's very true that nowadays there's a lot of sort of fake faith, if you will surrounding athletes, you know, the whole motivational um, quotes, things like that, the, the show voting, you know, for social media, whatever it may be, you know, I think a lot of that is just based off of, you know, our culture and what, what people think is, you know, supposed to be cool, which I think is great that people think, you know, being blessed and having, you know, God in their life is cool. But when people, you know, post and do stuff like that but then don't actually live it that's sort of the line where i'm i'm kind of wondering where where does that where does that where does one thing end and the next begin mm. and so whenever i i do you know see some of my teammates or whoever it may be making those you know those posts or you know talking about it or whatever it may be i, I always try to challenge them to you know if you really you know believe this then, you know come come to church with me or you know come to Bible study, whatever it may be. And I actually have had a, a little bit of success with that. A couple of, uh, a couple of my basketball uh, friends who are on the team at UND, I reached out to them and they come to our uh, Bible study every Tuesday night. And eventually, hopefully I'll be able to, you know, have them come to mass with me and see what it's about. And I think one thing to sort of help end that culture of, you know, fully secularness in, in, in our, in our you know, athletics is, allowing people to find God and find, you know, the church on their own versus you, you know, pushing it on them. So for me, I think it was more about saying, you know, here's this beautiful place that I love to go and have a strong relationship with. I would love to have that for you. You know, I'll be here this time. So if you'd like to come join me, if not, you know, you don't, cool, you know, you then, know yeah. yeah. Cause then they don't feel so much pressure and so much, you know, this is my faith. You have to have it too. It's more of a, you know, the door's open. It's an open invitation. I'm glad I can, you know, be of service to you. And, and I'm a guy that you can go with and, you know, know someone there. So it's not as, you know, challenging or threatening in your eyes, if you will. 
and we can sit down and just sit together. And then maybe if you have questions, we can talk about it. So, so you're talking about, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying there's a big difference between promotion and attraction. Absolutely. I mean, there's, you know, the attraction to the actual faith itself and being invested in God and prayer and going to Mass on Sunday is much lower than the promotion of the idea of it. You know, everyone loves the idea of having a good relationship with God. Everyone loves the idea of being that place in their faith. But when they actually go to try and do it, it's a lot harder than they think. So if they have somebody that's a model that can attract them, that, that means a lot. And I think, too, it's really good to have a person like me that's in their shoes because I know my relationship with God is not perfect by any means mm -hmm. and that there's so much that I, you know, fail at every day. And so that if they can see me as, you know, as a human being, as someone who's, you know, trying his best every day and still not making, you know, the, the relationship that he wants, then say, say, hey, maybe I can do it too, you know. Avery, you are... Um a journalism and a communications major, and so you deal with how people communicate ideas to other people. Um, how important do you think uh, things like social media are in either attracting or distracting people from their faith? I think it could be used to do both, as you said. Um, like it, it's an amazing tool to like spread the good news and like spread the gospel. But it also is hard because we see how it shortens our attention span. Hmm. How what do we, you mean by shortens our? Um, we don't want to hear like an hour long discussion about what a certain passage means or even a 10 minute sermon when we could just see like one story that is one quote from the Bible that makes us feel better. I think social media can get people in the door, as Jane was saying, where like they find stuff that is appealing to them, but I don't think it can get people all the way to sainthood. Like Facebook, you can have a thousand friends, but no true companions. Mm. And I think companionship is, important. is what gets someone to actually spend an hour a week in a church, not just a friend on a social media platform. That's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Juliana, you go to a program at O'Gorman that uh, I think is pretty much at least once a month, if not more, and it's called The Well. Explain that a little bit to us. Basically, you go, you can play, we'll play games like spike ball or bean bags before, and then we go and we go into the church. We either have adoration or we do praise and worship. And truthfully, there's like, everyone's at a different spot in their faith. And so you can be as open as you want. And you truthfully just get to like sing and like worship the Lord. And then afterwards, you can talk to other people about what you experience or you can go back and play games. It's, it's a really welcoming environment to those who maybe are kind of scared to take a step in their faith, but they can go and see what other people have and what they've experienced, and then they can continue to grow in their faith as well. So it's a deliberate way that you can uh, engage your faith in a different way than, let's say, uh, going to Mass or uh, having a discussion in the theology class. Yeah. One question that I'm always um, anxious to ask is this, and I'm going to ask it of all three of you, how important do you think the family is, your family is, in helping you keep your faith? I think it's very important. I mean, from the time you're a little kid, like your parents are bringing you to Mass, and you kind of learn that, but they also, like try and help you if you have questions like you should be able to go and ask them and hopefully they can help you but they're also like encouraging you to grow in your faith and I mean as you get older they kind of give you that choice like you can go to mass or you like you can 
not go to mass, but like you should go to mass. Like they kind of set that expectation and, but they're like pushing you to grow in your faith. So I think the family is very important. Yeah. I mean, the parents are the first catechesis. Like if you go to a Catholic school or even if you have a good religious education program at your parish, if it's not being nurtured at home, I don't think any faith can be built from that. So yeah, I know for me personally, just like falling in love with the mass from a young age, just cause I was here every Sunday. And my parents told me we're here every Sunday. So growing up like Sunday, what you go to church. Like it was weird for me, but that wasn't the case for other people. Just cause that's how I was brought up. But yeah, like as I grew up, like going to mass outside of the required Sunday, just cause I get to see how beautiful it is. But all that was just from at a young age being exposed to it. Peyton, what about you? You know, I think from the ages, you know, of you know, first born till eighteen, I think there's no one else more important to your faith than your family. Because, you know, growing up a cradle Catholic, I you know, it, just like Avery said, it Sunday was time to go to church. You know, you wake up, you go to mass and you sit in there and granted, you know, as a kid you're not necessarily the most attentive to what's going on. And, uh, you know, you could be, I don't think I was at a point where I could fall asleep as a kid in mass, but definitely was very distracted. And so one thing that I think, you know, my family helped me to sort of delve more into my faith and learn more about why I go to mass and why I enjoy it is having my mom after every mass, she'd ask me, you know, what was your favorite part about the homily? What was your favorite part about the sermon? Mm. Or, or, or maybe it was a little more test like it, you know, what was the big idea of the homily? What was the main, you know, message that the, that father was trying to put forward. And so that, you know, made me focus because if I could, you know, remember what was going on in mass, then maybe I could actually apply what was being said to my life. And your mother used that as a teaching. Yeah. Just sort of a conduit for me to go into my own, if you will, a sort of a, a boost, if you will. And from there on, I, you know, eventually she stopped asking, but I still continue to pay attention as to what it was going on. And that's sort of how my relationship with the church blossomed. And so I think families can sort of be that, you know, jump pad or trampoline, whatever you need to get to the next level of your faith. But once you're up there, you're sort of all alone after you turn, you know, after you turn 18. Sure, you know, especially with nowadays, you can reach out through text, you know, whatever method you like, but you truly are, you know, on your own and you have the responsibility to get yourself to make those decisions. And yeah, you get yourself in that pew and truly dial into what, you know, the father, the priest is saying in mass and understand it. You know, you're not going to get out and go into your car and have your mom waiting to ask you what the homily was today, but you still, you know, have to try and listen to it of your own. All three of you, you know, as I've watched in the five years that I've been at St. Therese, all three of you have um, one element in common in your faith. Each of you come from a different kind of perspective, maybe, but you are all active. Um, you're not just sitting up in the bleachers watching, you're down um, participating. I can remember. Avery, the very first week that I came to this parish, you were there every morning uh, to serve Mass. Um, Juliana, uh, on Sundays, you know, your family's always there, and you're always willing to come up afterwards and say, can I do something to help? And Jaden, you know, for so many years, not only did you serve Mass here, but you served Mass for the bishop. Uh, you were doing all kinds of different things to stay involved. And um, how important do you guys feel involvement is in keeping your faith? I think it's vital. I mean, when it comes to striving for the Lord, like 
if you're not actively swimming, the current will push you away. Mm. So you can't just stay in one spot. You have to keep moving. Yeah. I think involvement is paramount to anyone's success as, you know, as a Catholic, as, as a, you know, being of faith. I think for me, especially growing up, getting to, you know, serve for the bishop, you know, even just getting to serve here gave me almost like, I'd relate it honestly to like a game day excitement, you know, almost like I'm going to go out and, you know, play, you know, for my team, but instead of it being my team, you know, I'm out there playing for God. And so, you know, you ask God for strength, you know, when you're going out, you know, before you play, whatever it may be, God is your strength. You are playing for God here. So for me, that was just the most exciting thing. It was like, hey, I get to be a part of something. I remember always watching, you know, my brother and sister growing up, getting out, getting to altar serve and, you know, be up there on the altar so close to God. And I, you know, I think that was sort of what piqued my interest. And then once I got up, got to go up there and, you know, got a taste of how cool it really was and how, you know, in depth you can be with that. I think that's sort of what launched me into further, you know, search in my faith and you know what and to what kind of means. Branch on your own. yeah exactly juliana you have always been active as well not only in terms of serving and that type of thing but volunteering here at the church how important is that um personally i think it's really important because i think if you're just sitting at home not trying to get involved or not trying to volunteer you're just kind of being like i'm going to do the bare minimum and you're not really trying to grow your faith or like help other people, which I think is an important part of your relationship with God is showing like God through yourself. And so when I'm volunteering or trying to help, I personally feel like good about myself, like trying to show that like God through myself to other people and trying to like spread that relationship with God that I have to other people so that they may want to start growing in their faith too. One final question that I'm going to just throw out. If apologetics means the defense of the faith, um, how important do you think it is for each of you, all of us, to have a knowledge of the faith enough to be able to defend it? I think especially, you know, at our age, it's very important, especially when you have people who are constantly questioning you. I mean, everywhere you look, especially nowadays, there's going to be someone who, you know, God isn't real. You know, there's atheists, you know, growing you know, by the day. They, they take their, their hardships in their life or whatever's going on and makes make that a reason justifiable for leaving the church or whatever and constantly are going to question you like why are you staying i'm not you know you're not getting anything out of this but you have to have that not argument but that truth ready to to give to people that you know god is always good and what you may see as you know as negative right now or hurting you in the long run is going to build you up and make you a better person so that you can help others going through the same thing or whatever plan that God has for you. I think sometimes that truth gets lost and having that that understanding and that readiness to, to want to tell people and to help people so that when you do get questioned is something that you always need to have, especially in this day and age of what, what path and what stage we are in our lives. So you're saying you have to know the faith before mm-hmm. you can defend it. Exactly. Avery, what do you think? Yeah, I think having just the knowledge of the faith is good because we can't love what we can't know. And the church has been around for 2,000 years. Plenty of saints have written brilliant things like defending the church. So we should keep growing in knowledge of the faith for our own formation, but also just to defend it for others. As Jane said, not to like win an argument, but just out of love for God and out of love for them. Yeah. So, you know, when you're when you're defending the faith, not only are you helping them to understand, but you're increasing that 
level of understanding in yourself every time you do it. Yeah. Juliana. Well, I think that having a, not necessarily an argument, but having like a rebuttal to what someone says, like you can help them start that journey or maybe they're just like, don't want it at all. But you can defend yourself knowing that like God is, like what Jaden said, God is always good no matter what the circumstances, like he's always gonna pull through for you and helping other people understand that no matter what their circumstances are, I think is just laying the base foundation for them with their faith. So it's a constant exploration. Yeah. One last thing I wanna ask each of you, what, who's your favorite saint? I don't know. I would have to say my confirmation saint, which is Saint Cecilia. I mean, she's a patron saint of music, and I, I love music. So, okay. Avery. Can I say two? Sure. Saint Gabriel. The archangel. Was, yeah, the first evangelist. And then Saint Francis Xavier, my confirmation saint, patron and why, of missionaries. Why Francis Xavier? Um, he just recognized what the church, where the church wasn't, and knew it was his call to go there as a missionary. And he formed the Jesuits, yeah. which are cool. Yep, he was, he, Ignatius of Loyola was the founder, but he helped form where that order went. Yeah. In fact, you heard one of his uh, favorite Bible passages today in the gospel, what profit a man if he, Gain the whole world and in the process suffer the loss of his soul. So, Jaden. I'd say number one is St. Pope John Paul II. I mean, the work that he did around the world and not just sort of being a stagnant pope and being a true, you know, relation to the people and helping, you know, grow our faith in parts of the world that you really wouldn't expect it to be. And just sort of in his, in his short tenure as pope passing away in 2005 I think he did a lot of good for the world in a short amount of time and I really can't imagine what he you know could have done had he had more time but I think for sure him and then yeah, I'd gotta say Saint Michael's one of my favorite too the Archangel you know Saint just Michael the, the Archangel just yeah. the you know power and strength that he had to beat Lucifer and send him down I mean it's just I, I'd, I'd love to see how that you know went it was incredible to me I have two, St. Michael the Archangel and St. Jose Sanchez del Rio, the little Mexican boy that gave his life for the faith. I thank you all for being here and sharing with us on living the little way about what faith to young people means. Uh, and when I say young people, I'm really talking about you being young adults, you know, out in the world, influencing people by the way you live your faith. Thank you for being with us today, and we close now in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.